I'll be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 to 21 from the New Living Translation. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident, and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we will be at home with the Lord. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. And we, are we commending ourselves to you again? No, we are giving you a reason to be proud of us, so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that everyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God, who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciliation reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, go, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Father, will you please speak to us and teach us to love our Lord. Amen. Well, all of us, at some point or another, are called on to defend our ministry. I don't know whether for you, uh, it might be family members uh, who look at you slightly weirdly and you know are asking, either dying to ask the question or just ask you regularly why it is that you've thrown your whole life away to spend four years at this crazy place to do this crazy job that no one's going to pay you to do. Uh, perhaps for you it's when you catch up with old work colleagues from places that you've worked and you know that they just look at you as this slightly strange friend uh, that they speak to occasionally but they don't want to get too close to. Or maybe it's your old school friends that you get with and you know that they're studiously avoiding asking you anything at all about what you do uh, just in case you're going to raise that topic that's going to make everything awkward and uncomfortable. So whether it's friends or family or colleagues or whatever it is, at any point in time there's this question for us, how do you defend this crazy preaching Jesus loving people serving others for the sake of God thing that we do? And in a sense, that's actually a helpful place to come to this passage in 2 Corinthians 5 because 2 Corinthians 5 is really a letter of Paul's defence of his ministry. And Paul's actually needing to defend his ministry for a whole bunch of reasons. He's got to defend it because he promised the Corinthians he was going to show up and then he didn't and he's got to defend his actions. He's written the Corinthians a very difficult letter full of anguish, calling on them to repent and change that's caused him pain and them pain. And finally, he's writing to a church full of people that we'll see in a few chapters' time have actually started to be persuaded by these super apostles that what Paul taught them was really not the gospel at all. 
And so Paul finds himself in this space, right, where he's talking to this group of people that he loved, spoke the gospel to, formed the church of, and they're now pulling away from him and he's trying to argue, no, what I have told you is the real thing and this really matters. And so the letter's actually full of this anguished description and plea that they might accept Paul's ministry as God's ministry. So I pray that as we look in chapter 5 at Paul's defence of his ministry, that you might be reminded and persuaded again that this is what God is doing in the world and that you might be persuaded again that this mad, crazy, stupid thing that you're doing here at college and planning to do for the rest of your life is actually the right kind of thing to do in the world that God's made. So I want to pick up Paul's defence there in verse 11. Paul does the ministry that he does because he is understanding of the fear of the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 5, sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. When I first looked at the text, I was struck by verse 11, and I have to tell you, not just by verse 11, but really the first half of verse 11, because it's a preacher's verse. If ever there's been a preacher's verse, this is it. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. It's two simple points. You could turn it into a fantastically easy sermon. The only problem with the first half of verse 11 is the second half of verse 11. Because he seems to go on a tangent that seems almost irrelevant. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it's known to your conscience also. And actually the problem continues, verse 12, we're not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance, not about what is in the heart. For if we're beside ourselves, it's for God, and if we're not in our right mind, it's for you. Paul kind of gives you this headline, wonderful declaration. Because of the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. And then he goes into this long explanation of his relationship with the Corinthians and why he might be crazy or not crazy and how all of that works and how you can answer people who are... And what's going on? Sometimes your principles are a pain in the neck. Uh, And when it comes to preaching the Bible, keep letting your principles be a pain in the neck. Paul's first and foremost point here is not particularly to persuade you to go and persuade others because you fear the Lord but it's rather his description of where he stands before God in relation to the Corinthians because he's trying to persuade the Corinthians that he's acted with absolute transparency in relationship with them. See, pick it up in verse 9. Whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We're not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Paul wants to say, I know that I'm going to stand before Jesus in the judgment. And because I know that I'm going to stand before Jesus in the judgment, my aim is to please him and to do the work that he has given me to do. And because of that, actually, who I am before God is who I am before you. And actually, if people look at me and think that I'm crazy because of this thing that I do, well, they want to know that my craziness is because... Before God, my conscience is completely clear. I sail the seven seas and get shipwrecked and get stoned and get beaten and get ridiculed and go hungry because before God, I know what God is doing in the world and he has given me this job of preaching the gospel. And if people look at me and think that I am crazy, that's okay because I'm crazy for God's sake. And then he says, but if people can actually see me and see that I'm in my right mind, what they will realise is that I've been persuaded by the gospel not to live for me, but for you. If I'm in my right mind, Corinthians, it is for your sake. Paul's life has been transformed by the fact that he knows that he stands always in the presence of the living God and will one day stand before the judgment seat of Christ so that what you see is what you get. Who he is before God is who he is in relationship with other people. 
and who he is before God and in relationship with other people has nothing to do with himself. Now just think about what that means for us for a moment. See, what's Paul's defence as he tries to explain his ministry? It is that I have to answer to Jesus and because I have to answer to Jesus, I'm going to love you. Brothers and sisters, I just want to ask you again, as we kind of ask each other regularly, to just examine your own heart for a moment. Do you remember each and every day that you will stand absolutely bare before the throne of the living Christ and the works that you do and the words that you speak will be made known before him and because of that it is your treasure to please Jesus who has been raised from the dead as Lord of all. And because of that your life's not about you anymore actually It's about the people that you would love because Christ has loved the world. That's actually who we are. That's the meaning of being Christian, if you like. Paul says, I fear the Lord and I seek to persuade others. And that's just an outworking of understanding the reality of what God's done in Jesus. Because you see, his second point is that if you understand the love of Christ you understand that everything has changed. Pick it up in verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all and therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. For Paul, it's not just the fear of Christ that controls him, but the love of Christ that controls him. And do you notice that the love of Christ is unpacked in this deep gospel logic. There is a fundamental set of logical steps that you cannot escape. Christ died for all. Therefore all died so that they might no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and rose again. Do you hear what Paul is saying to you? When you became a Christian, you died. If you belong to Jesus, you're dead. That is the fundamental reality of being Christian. And if you start to think of that as a bad thing, then you've misunderstood. You died because your old life was rubbish. It was useless. It was foolish. It was stupid to live for yourself. It was stupid to live for the things of the world that will pass away at a moment's notice. It was stupid to live for the career or the status or the praise of other people. They were actually ridiculous reasons for living. And in your sin and rebellion against God, God has sent his son to die so that you could die so that you might actually have life. And what does the passage define life as? Life is living for him who for your sake died and rose again. Do you stop and just drink that in and remember it? That is life. True life, real life, the life that's worth living is actually to love God and to love your neighbour. To live a life that's compelled by the gospel out of the grace of Christ. To live for holiness and godliness and to long for others to know the Lord who has brought them and will bring them home is life itself. The joy and privilege of being given entry into people's lives to speak about their hearts as they try to work out what it means to serve Christ. The privilege of being given entry into the lives of people who don't yet know Jesus, who want to talk to you and argue with you about what you think and believe as an opportunity and a moment to grant them life from death. That's the actual process that goes on as you explain the gospel. 
with those kids in Sunday school on Sunday morning or with the youth group when you turn up on Friday night or when you get to speak in front of church or the one-to-one conversation across the back fence when you go into the shops, when you get to sit and speak about Jesus, you are actually offering people life from death and you are speaking about life and life in the full. Because if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. What Jesus will one day do as he restores the whole of the cosmos, he already does spiritually in the hearts and minds of people as they turn to Jesus and are regenerate by the Spirit. You are involved in the ministry of life. Be excited by that. Be thrilled by it. Be thankful to God for the moments that you get to sit and speak to people about the gospel. Here is life itself. But do you notice that for Paul, that means his view of the whole world has been transformed. Verse 16, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. We once regarded Christ according to the flesh and we regard him thus no longer. Paul once thought of Jesus as an imposter. Paul once thought of Jesus as an evil person who had come to actually destroy the Jewish nation and turn people away from God. He viewed Christ as the absolute enemy and he gave his whole life to the destruction of Christ's people. And then in one moment, Jesus appears to him, the spirit enters his heart, his whole life is turned around and all of a sudden he sees Christ as he really is, the Messiah, the King the saviour and ruler of all of the worlds. And at that moment, Paul's view of every person in the world is transformed. We no longer regard anyone according to the flesh. He doesn't look at people and consider them in the way that you and I do. He doesn't look at people and see intelligence or bank accounts or beauty or status or opportunity for progression or relationships or any of the other... What he sees is people who belong to God and who are in desperate need of recreation. And when Paul looks at Christians, he doesn't look at their giftedness or their power or their ability or their strength. He just sees people in whom God has done the work of bringing about the new creation. Every person that you meet this Sunday in whom Christ has been at work is a new creation. No matter how messed up and crazy and slightly odd and socially awkward and difficult they are. And just in case you haven't noticed, you should have looked at yourself in regards to that description. Because what God has done is he's brought life from the dead. And so you see, Paul fears Jesus and longs to please him because he understands that the love of Christ is this, that one has died for all and therefore all have died. And they have died not to live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And so, Paul's third point in his defence, verse 18, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And just in case you missed it, he says it again, verse 19, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Do you see the twofold movement? In Christ God was reconciling the world to himself and entrusting the ministry of reconciliation. Who is your God? What does he do in the world? He reconciles. That's who he is. He is the reconciler. And what he was doing in Christ, every time we turn up in chapel and remind ourselves about what Jesus has done, what we are reminding each other of is God's plan for the whole of creation. That's what God's on about, reconciling the world to himself. And in order to reconcile the world to himself, he has entrusted the message of reconciliation to us, to those who would be 
ambassadors for Jesus. Brothers and sisters, if you want a defence for why you're here, ambassador for Jesus is a pretty darn good one, it seems to me. Who do you want to work for? Who do you want to brag about? Who do you want to claim that you know? Well, I reckon claiming that you know the king of the universe is pretty good. And I reckon that turning up and saying that I work for the king of the universe is a reasonably excellent thing to have on your CV. And actually, it doesn't matter how crazy they think you are because in your right mind, you understand what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it. Why is it that we have Mission Awareness Week? Because it's just the logic of the gospel. What's God doing in the world? He's reconciling people to himself. And you are here because you have grasped that and are continuing to grasp it and you're praying for each other in order to go to the ends of the world that the ends of the world might be reconciled to God because that's what God was doing in Christ. If you grasp that he who knew no sin became sin for us in order that we might be the righteousness of God, that you have no other option. What are you going to do with that piece of information? You've died. Your life doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Jesus. And his glory is your purpose. Brothers and sisters, I don't know uh, where you're at at this moment in time. Excited about being back for second semester. Maybe doing that grindy thing that happens when you come back from holidays and you try to get back into life, having had that moment of breath and wondering when you're going to have it again and you've just let go of it and just remember the privilege of sitting here week by week to drink in the scriptures and encourage and push each other on to know and love Jesus and to serve the people that you serve with the gospel. And whatever it is that God has stirred in your heart this week as you have heard about mission, pursue it. Pray for God's help to work it out. Don't give in to fear, but understand that wherever God takes you for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ will not be for your ill, but for your good. That you would die and find life in the service of Jesus is to find life. Brothers and sisters, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. Be reconciled to God. So on Sunday when you walk into church, ambassador for Christ, Christ making his appeal through you, be reconciled. As you walk into the shops on King Street over the weekend or in downtown Croydon or in the middle of Parramatta this weekend, you are Christ's ambassador, God making his appeal through you, be reconciled to God. And wherever you go after college, you are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through you, be reconciled to God. Because for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his life and death and resurrection for us. Thank you that he died for all. And thank you, Father, that in him we die in order that we might find life. Father, would you please remind us, hour by hour and day by day, that we will one day stand before our Lord and his judgment seat. Will you help us to be in person what we believe in our hearts? Will you train us to love others for Christ's sake? And will you please equip us to be ambassadors? to go to the ends of the earth with the precious news that you are our God. Amen.